Sometimes it takes a mountain. Sometimes a troubled sea. Sometimes it takes a desert to get a hold. We are a body of many parts where every part matters and every member cares. Uh, and, and everyone, if they find their part, because it's, it's associated with their gifting, it's not a, well, you're more important than I am, you're less, no, this is what I love doing. When we attack one another, it distracts from what God has called us to do. And there's plenty to be done. No, he died of a broken heart. Imagine you injure your foot and you favor it by walking strangely, and then you feel backache. Now you compensate for that pain only to cause discomfort in your neck. Our physical bodies are extremely interconnected. One thing affects another. Today on Living Truth, Brett McBride continues his series on The Good Life, 
reminding us of the importance of unity for the church to be healthy. Just like our physical body, the body of Christ has many parts which rely on one another. When we are critical or reject one part of the church, it is damaging to the whole body. This is Living Truth. Good morning, church. You can turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 12, but you know that already. Last week, we started a three-week series entitled The Good Life. I saw on TV all the uh, gym membership ads, all the fitness equipment, and all the uh, marketing that we go into for New Year's resolution time. I talked about that last week. Uh, There was a specific prayer that I was praying for our church. I'll speak to that next weekend. But it made me ask the question, what makes a spiritual body healthy? What is the good life for the body of Christ? Are there some practical things we can resolve ourselves to that will improve the overall health of the spiritual body? And we've been using 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 13 uh, as our text to look into because I believe Paul writes in those two chapters some basic things that the body of Christ can give itself to that promotes health within the body. Last week we looked at spiritual gifts and Paul calls attention to the fact that there are different gifts, different ministries, different manifestations of who God is. So there's all these different gifts, different ministries, different manifestations, but the same spirit, but the same Christ, but the same God at work in them all. And we spent some time unpacking that last week. And then we talked about how a healthy church exercises every member in the body of Christ has been given a grace Gift. The Holy Spirit has deposited a gift within you, and we talked about the importance of exercising our spiritual gifts. And then Paul turns his attention from the ministries within the church to the members itself and spends the rest of the chapter talking about that. Before we dive into the text, I just want to use an analogy that hopefully gets us thinking in a certain direction. Let's just say that you did enter into 2017 and made a New Year's resolution, or someone in your office or your school or in your neighborhood made a New Year's resolution. We've all encountered this in our lives when someone decides to turn over a new leaf to start eating a bit healthier and start working out. And you might go to the lunchroom at school or at your workplace, and this person is discovering the benefits of eating healthy. Maybe they've taken on the paleo diet. And they're there eating their paleo meal, and you're eating your normal food. You're eating your BLT sandwich or something with mayonnaise on it. And while you're enjoying your BLT sandwich, they're sharing with you how paleo is the way to go. And as they share all the benefits of eating healthier, you're feeling a little bit less healthy. And they're talking about how you ought to be a little more like them. Has anyone ever experienced that? Meanwhile, they've only been eating that way for two weeks, but they're trying to convert you over to the paleo way. It can be a lot like that when we start to exercise our spiritual gifts, when we start to serve and put the gifts within us into exercise, we start to understand who God is in different ways, and we start to think that we have it going on. We start to compare ourselves with other members in the body, and it can be a a trouble for those who are exercising their gifts to get into this pattern where we start to judge others according to their gifts and how it's different from ours. Let me give you some examples. If we have the spiritual gift of administration, if we can look at chaos and somehow create systems that make everything more organized, we might become a little frustrated or judgmental of those who don't have that spiritual gift. Can I get an amen? Amen. If we have the spiritual gift of evangelism, we're burdened for the lost and we're out there witnessing, we may look at other members within the body and wonder why they have such apathy. And we might become judgmental of other members in the body because they don't function as we do. 
If we have the gift of helps and we see the needs within the body and we jump in and we help, we might become a little frustrated or judgmental of those who seemingly don't help or don't see the needs within the body and they don't function the way we do. And so Paul is writing to a body that is being divided against itself. Some are saying, I follow Paul, I follow Peter, I follow Apollos, and they're tearing each other apart. There's divisions within the church, there's arguing within the church, there's schools or camps of thought within the church. And to this body, Paul is writing, and he turns his attention from the different ministries to the members itself, and he reminds the church that none of us embody who God is on our own. The church is made up of a community of believers, and when that community is exercising the gifts that Christ has placed within them, it gives a fuller expression of who God is and that we are one body. There is no solo Christianity. If you are not in a church, you are missing a huge part of understanding who God is. And Paul begins to explain to them the mystery of Christ's body, one body made up of many parts. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12, we read the following. Just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, and the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. As we look at this text, we're gonna be progressing through three thoughts that Paul unpacks here, and they are a body of many parts, where every part matters and every member cares. We are a body of many parts, where every part matters and every member cares. Start with the body of many parts. In verse 12, Paul uses an analogy to explain the diversity within the body, and he's actually arguing about the diversity within the body, that the collective differences come together in one collected whole. But in verse 13 and 14, he makes a statement, and I just wanna spend five, 10 minutes unpacking that statement because it is profound theologically. In verse 13, he says, for we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body. Whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, we were all given the one spirit to drink. This is remarkable within the early church, what Paul is unpacking. It was actually something that they wrestled with within the early church. In Acts chapter 18, Paul is on a missionary journey. He's been going from city to city to city throughout the book of Acts, sharing the gospel, God's moving, people are coming to faith, the church is growing, but each city he went to, he faced persecutions. Oftentimes, he would uh, face verbal persecution. There would be resistance to his ministry. Sometimes he was stoned. One time he was left for dead. He would face floggings or beatings. And so Paul's had a rough go as a missionary. And in Acts chapter 18, he comes to the city of Corinth. And he's had all these previous experiences of persecution and resistance to the gospel. 
And the city of Corinth is a large city. There's a quarter of a million people in Corinth, 250,000 people at the time of Paul. And in Acts chapter 18, verses 9 and 10, we read this. One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. So God looks over Corinth, a quarter of a million people, and he says, Paul, you are my chosen tool to speak to this people. Preach on. I have many people in this city. Now, this is the remarkable thing. Paul, later, writing to the Corinthian church that's been established, takes a moment in his first Corinthians book to unpack what the Corinthians were before they came to Christ. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9, Paul, writing about the church in Corinth, says this, do you not know that the unjust will not inherit God's kingdom? Do not be deceived, no sexually immoral people, idolaters, adulterers, male prostitutes, homosexuals, thieves, greedy people, drunkards, revilers, or swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And look at what Paul says in verse 11. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Now take Acts chapter 18 and how God looks at Corinth and take 1 Corinthians 6 and compare what Paul would have been seeing when he walked through Corinth. God looks over the city of Corinth and he says to Paul, tell them, speak to them, do not be afraid to testify to who Jesus is. And Paul would have been walking through Corinth and he wouldn't have the benefit of a heavenly vision as God does. He would only have the benefit of seeing the external person and what he would have seen was people who were worshiping idols. Corinthian was famous for its sexual immorality. He would have seen immoral people. He would have seen drunk people. He would have seen greedy people. He would have seen people bowing down to idols. And I wonder if Paul, sitting in Corinth, looking around at how pagan that city was, when God said, I have many people in this city, did Paul look around and go, really? You do? Because all I can see is people who are giving themselves over to every type of sensual indulgence. And I wonder if God is saying to him, tell them, Paul, tell them. Tell them about what I did for them. God looks from heaven. Yes, Paul, I know they're swindling. Yes, Paul, I know they're lying and cheating and getting drunk and giving themselves to all kinds of sexual impurity, but tell them what I did for them. Tell them how I came to reveal who I am in the person of Christ. Tell them that I was stripped and beaten and nailed to a cross and poured out my life so that they could have a relationship with the one true God. And the miracle that takes place when we come to Christ and we put our faith in Christ is that we are transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. When Paul writes to the Corinthian church, he describes all these ways that sin dominates our lives, and then he says, and that is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified by Jesus, and the one spirit has come to live and reside in you. He reminds them of who they really are. You are one body baptized by one spirit, and you are now literally a member of his body of which he is the head. This is the mystery of our relationship with Christ. We become members of his body, not members of a social club, Not members who all tick a box of a creed or a list of doctrines, members of a body. 
His Holy Spirit comes to live and reside in us when we look to Christ and put our faith in what he did on the cross. He sends his Holy Spirit to live within us. And this was a radical understanding in the early church. Paul was a Pharisee by birth. He was a Jew who had given his life to purity. And God sent him to reach seemingly some people who were pretty impure in their practices. And it was a radical understanding that God's salvation and God's grace extended to all mankind within the early church. And in verse 14, when Paul says, even so the body is not made up of one part, but of many, Paul is emphasizing the diversity within the body. And we can unwittingly, in our Christianity, get into what I would describe as a Christian ghetto mindset. Let me explain what I mean. The definition of ghetto is an isolated or segregated group or area. We can slowly get into a ghetto mindset where we think that our church or our denomination or our spiritual gift is the best way or the only way that God moves. Paul emphasizes in this text the beautiful diversity within the body. Jews united with Greeks, every race, every tribe, every language, every people brought together under one head, Christ the Lord, beautifully diverse, made into one body. This would have been radical in Jesus' day and in Paul's day. A slave and a slave owner worshiping together. A Jew and a Gentile worshiping the same Lord. Paul doesn't argue for this viewpoint. Paul argues from this viewpoint in the text. We are a body of many parts where every part matters. And then Paul in verse 15 begins to gently display how every part matters. Look at verse 15. Now if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. Now just imagine with me, if you will, that you are a foot. Imagine that we're all feet in this room and just imagine with me Mr. Foot saying something like this, sitting there in his sock, in his shoe. Mr. Foot thinks to himself, man, I hate that hand. That hand gets all the attention. That hand gets a little bit of dirt on it, and, my, and the body's washing that hand to make sure it's clean. That hand gets beautiful jewelry placed on it. That hand gets to shake other hands. That hand gets to hold other hands. What about me? I'm just a foot. I get stuck in a sock. I get rammed in a shoe. By the end of the day, I smell like dog's breath. <laughs> That's it. I'm out of here. The foot may feel undervalued. Mr. Foot may feel so underappreciated. Nobody recognizes my contribution to the body. Not realizing that his function, although different, is essential to the body. Paul goes on in verse 16, he says, if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. Again, imagine Mrs. Ear saying to the other ear, I can't stand those eyes. Those eyes get all the makeup put on them. They get to stare deeply into someone else's eyes. I can't stand the eyes. We're just hanging off this head, looking awkward. Do you know that our ears and our nose will never stop growing? They'll just keep getting bigger and bigger? One ear saying to the other ear, we're already pretty big. We're gonna look like Dumbo pretty soon. <laughs> Imagine Mrs. Ear saying that. And Paul uses this argument and he's basically saying to the Corinthian church who is divided, some saying that they're not members of the same body as their fellow believers in the city of Corinth. He's saying it's absurd. Just as we cannot disown a member of our own bodies because we don't like it 
or it is different than us and functions differently, we equally cannot say, I follow Apollos, I follow Peter, I follow Paul. We cannot be a body divided against ourselves. And Paul goes on to say that if we continue in that ghetto mindset where we're segregating ourselves from the rest of the body and ignore certain members of the body, there will be an impact on our ability to function. In verse 17, Paul says, if the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? If we were all an eye, we would be lacking the sense of hearing. We would be unable to function the way we were designed to function fully. If we were all ears, where would the sense of smell be? If we were all ears and we had no eyes, where would our sense of vision be? I used to work in kitchens. I remember one time I was working, making some salads, and I was working with very, very hot peppers. And I cut up a bunch of hot peppers, mixed them in this salad that I was making, and then went on to some other jobs. I had cleaned my workstation with some chemicals. Uh, About 20 minutes later, I scratched my eye and I was rubbing my eyes really hard, and then all of a sudden I started to lose my vision. My eyes started to burn. And I thought, oh no, I'm going blind. It must be some of the chemicals that I had used when I was cleaning my workstation. So I'm at the hazmat eye thing. I'm squeezing water into my eyes. My eyes are burning. I can't see. I'm walking around. Sharp knives everywhere. I'm in a kitchen. I'm blind right now. And what had happened is one of the hot peppers and the oils from the hot peppers were on my fingers and I had rubbed it into my eyes. It is very difficult to function without certain parts of our body. And the Corinthian church is trying to function as a body divided against itself. And Paul says, if you deny certain parts of the body, your ability to function will be limited. But he states something even more severe than that. We're going to spend our remaining moments on this one. In verse 18, Paul says this, but in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. Think about that for a moment. God has placed the parts of the body, which ones of them? Every single one of them, just as he wanted them to be. Now imagine Paul writing this to a church that's fighting with one another. And it begs the question, if God has done this, if he is in fact the one who places each part of the body just as he determines it to carry out a particular function, who are we to say that the part that he placed, because it is different than us, is not valid? We are in a dangerous, dangerous place if we give in to that line of thinking. And sometimes in my generation, I see Christians attacking other Christians on Facebook and Twitter and having very public disagreements with their brothers and sisters for the whole world to see. And when I see those posts, I think to myself, all my friends who don't know Jesus yet, what do they think when they see brothers and sisters who are called to unity, to express unity and loving concern for one another? What do they think when they see these postings? And when I first came on staff at the church here, I spent a lot of time studying our history, studying our founder, Oswald Smith. And I was amazed when I looked through the records of our history as I studied his ministry and looked at how he founded the church, why he founded the church, and a number of articles. I realized that during the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, when this church was just being founded, it was criticized severely for its ministry. Oswald Smith would use all kinds of methods 
to reach people who didn't know Jesus yet, but it was scandalous in his day and age. If you attended the people's church, you were probably considered a worldly Christian. And he was criticized by other churches. They would meet in a public theater, a secular theater, and people thought that was scandalous. He would have female evangelists speak on the platform in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, drawing severe criticism from other churches just down the road. He would employ all types of arts ministries and other things to reach people with the gospel. He was single-minded in his conviction, in his desire to reach out for the thousands of people who have never entered a church door. He was driven that all might experience and know the gospel, but they used all kinds of methods that other brothers and sisters didn't appreciate. One time the church brought in a speaker that created quite the controversy within some secular groups and there was security at the doors because there was a massive protest just outside the front doors. And someone had managed to get past the security. There were police checking bags because it was so intense what was going on and someone got in with a coconut cream pie and cream pied Paul Smith in the face. But Oswald had one value that he lived by in the face of the severe criticism of others, and it was this, no attack, no defense. Never attack someone else's ministry and never waste your energy trying to defend your own. It distracts you from what God's calling you to do. Give care to what God thinks, but not what man thinks, even when it may be coming from your own brothers and sisters. And to the church in Corinth, Paul writing to a group that is being torn apart and divided, Paul says the same thing, no attack, no defense. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3, he says this, I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. And so all I'm saying is this, as a church, we need to be very very careful when we feel like we're supposed to attack another part of the body. When we judge others, we may not realize that we are unwittingly judging a part of the body that God himself has arranged to carry out a certain function. And we can get stuck in this segregated mindset and not realize that we are a part of a larger body and sometimes we're attacking our own body, denying other parts of our own body. And as the Corinthian church experienced, Paul says to them, you are worldly, mere infants, utterly defeated. You cannot be at war with your own body because when you're at war with your own body, and that's the body of Christ, you're trying to stand in judgment of God who placed that body. And Satan certainly wants to divide us, does he not, as a church? Maybe you're here this morning and within this sanctuary, this gathering, you might have a grievance with another member in this body. There's gonna be moments where we hurt each other even if we love one another. I've been married for 17 years. My wife and I hurt each other. Sometimes. The Bible's filled with texts on forgiving one another because inevitably we're going to hurt one another. We're going to let each other down. But we need to be a body that practices forgiveness of one another, not judgment. And sometimes we move to that too quickly. And so Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 12 that every part is indispensable. 
Every cell, every organ, every member gives and receives and carries out a specific function within God's economy. But we are members of one body where every part matters and lastly, every member cares. Verse 25, he says, there should be no division in the body, that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. And certainly, this has local application. As the people's church body, we need to be reminded continually that we are one body. We are members of one another. God has placed gifts within each of us to be exercised for his purposes as one body pointing to one Savior, Jesus Christ. But can I suggest to you this morning that this text also has regional applications. As I mentioned earlier in the message, Corinth is a city of a quarter of a million people. There's no indication that the church as it grew all met in one location. So it's safe to assume that they met in different house fellowships. And when God looks down from heaven on Corinth, does he see it as distinct fellowships separate from one another? Or does he look down on Corinth, a city of a quarter of a million people, he has many people in that city, as he looks down, does he just see his church? I suggest to you that he just sees his church. And when God looks down on Toronto today, does he only see the people's church? Does he look down and go, oh, there's the people's church? They're so mission-minded. I love their burden for the lost. That's my church right there. Certainly, yes, he sees the people's church, but he doesn't see only the people's church. But we can get into that mindset, can't we? Does God look down on Toronto and he goes, oh, there's the Baptists. They're still immersing. I love that immersion. Does he look down and say, oh, there's the Anglicans. They're so liturgical. It warms my liturgical heart. Oh, look, it's the Pentecostals. Man, those guys can throw a party. Let's get some Holy Spirit up in here, right? Does he look down and he goes, oh, there's the Harvest Church. They're harvesting. They're zealous for me. Oh, look, it's the Meeting House. They're part of the Brethren in Christ. The BIC, yeah, you know me. I'm down with the BIC. Does God look down and does he go, oh, it's the meeting house, the Baptists, the Pentecostals, the Anglicans? No, I suggest to you, he looks down from heaven and what he sees is his church. One body. One body. All sharing the same Holy Spirit residing within them because they have placed their faith in the risen Savior, Jesus. We are a united body. We are a conjoined body. We have been knit together by God. And when he looks down, he sees his church. That is why the Baptists cannot say to the Pentecostals, because you are not Baptist, I don't belong to you. The Harvest Church cannot Say to the meeting house, because you are not harvest, I don't belong to you. The people's church cannot say to the Bayview Glen, because you aren't people's, I don't belong to you. We are one body, united by one spirit, by our faith in Christ. It isn't a creed or an article that makes us one. It is the Holy Spirit himself. And we are to have equal concern for one another. That is why when we call one another out in Facebook and don't talk face to face out our differences, I believe it grieves our Father. But this text also has global application, and we're gonna end with this. The Middle Eastern church cannot say to the European church, because you are not Middle Eastern, we don't belong to you. 
The South American church cannot say to the Asian church, because you are not South American, we don't belong to you. The Indian church cannot say to the African church, because you are not Indian, we don't belong to you. The Filipino church cannot say to the Australian church, because you are not Filipino, we don't belong to you. Our governments may say that. But our citizenship has been transferred to the kingdom of light. We have one king, his name is Jesus. And we have a heavenly citizenship. Whether Jew or Gentile, slave or free, rich or poor, it doesn't matter, it is all one in Christ Jesus. We are a global body. All people, all nations, every tribe, every language, one in Christ. We have been baptized by the Holy Spirit into one body. We are no longer what we were. We are a new creation. And next week, we're gonna talk about what Paul describes as the most excellent way for the body to function. But the greatest event that took place in your life when you placed your faith in Christ, you became a member of Christ's body himself. And so let us be careful that we don't fall into the same pit of judging one another. Yes, we're going to let each other down. Yes, we're going to disappoint one another. That's why the Bible's so full of forgiveness and learning to love one another. But let us Always, always, always remember, we have been baptized into one family. And that diversity displays the wonder of who God is. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this text. We thank you for the challenge that it is. And Lord, we acknowledge, I acknowledge many times speaking rashly about your body. We ask your forgiveness for the ways that we've grieved you or hurt one another with our words, with our posts. Father, we pray that we would be a healthy body, constantly reminded that we are conjoined to you and to one another by the Holy Spirit. We have different gifts, different ministries, and different functions but may they function well together, pointing to Jesus as Lord. I pray for the church and our generation. Oftentimes, so much division and fear in our world. May we display the wonder of unity so that all men and women, boys and girls would know the beautiful unity that Jesus has with you, Father, and with the Holy Spirit. May that reside within your church. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. It's deeply comforting to know that when we come to Christ, we become members of his body, not a club or a set of doctrines or a way of worshiping. As Paul writes to the Corinthian church, he reminds them who they are in Christ and that it's his spirit living within which unites them. Knowing this, it's amazing that we spend so much of our time pointing out differences, allowing them to bring unnecessary division. When we attack one another, it distracts from what God has called us to do, and there's plenty to be done. The capacities God gives us may not be the same as someone else, and that's to be celebrated. Now we have a reason to get to know that person, to share, learn, and grow in Christ. It's important to maintain a healthy body, a healthy mind, and a healthy spirit. How about a healthy church? In his series, The Good Life, Brett McBride encourages us to look at the church body and ask, what makes a spiritual body healthy? What is the good life for those who are part of the body of Christ? This series by Brett McBride is available on CD and DVD.
learn at home, give to a friend, or plan a group Bible study. To order your series, write to the address on your screen or call free phone 0 800 197 3434. To order online, visit livingtruth.co.uk. No part of the human body works in isolation. Each part does its job day and night, supported and aided by all the other organs. In 1 Corinthians, Paul uses the human body as an analogy to describe the church in order for us to better work together and serve one another. This analogy that, that we find in scripture that Paul uses of the the church being like a body. Do you find this a helpful analogy in understanding and thinking about the church? Oh, absolutely. I think it's, it's, it's like, you know, the, for the body, if you feed it, it will grow. You don't have to tell yourself to grow. All you have to do is make sure you, you feed the body. And I think the same thing with the church. If you feed it on the Word of God, wholesome, healthy food, it will grow and it will take care of itself. I think it's very helpful for people in a congregation to realize how vital they are. But we all know that every part is vital. So, so when you're asking people, where would you be able to volunteer or where could you help or wh where do you think you fit here? Um, it's, it's really giving that understanding to people. It really matters that you show up. It matters that you, yeah. that you come every Sunday, not just for yourself, but for other people. You might have something beautiful to say to someone. You might be really an encouragement mm -hmm. to them, the fact that you actually came today. So, so just realizing how interwoven we are and how important we are, it's really not about just the people up at the front. It's, it's the health comes from really everybody else. Mm -hmm. I found this, uh, the description of the human body on a biology site, and I loved the wording in light of, of the analogy, because the body of Christ. Mm. It says, no part of the body works in isolation. Mm. Each part does its job day and night, supported and aided by all of the other organs. Where or how do you see this in action within the church? My husband and I have a church in Toronto, and yes, there are, you know, there's a great staff and people who preach and people who counsel, and they're there every day. Um, but none of the actual things that happen <coughs> at the church could happen without all the other people who are involved. I mean, just even the running of the nursery and the toddlers, I mean, if people don't volunteer for that, if they don't come and look after babies, then those families probably wouldn't attend and wouldn't be able to come and listen to a sermon. And so, you know, you, you, you see on every Sunday just how many different working parts there are um, to just, and, and we're a small church, we're not a big church, but even on, on a small level, you know, you still need so many people. And, and I think the more people are involved, the the more buy-in they have, you know, mm -hmm. they, they actually feel mm -hmm. I, I belong here, I have a role, they can see it. And, and if you're using the gifts that God gave you, uh, whatever they are, you're, you're completely satisfied with that. Uh, and, and everyone, if they find their part, because it's, it's associated with their gifting, it's not a, well, you're more important than I am, you're less, no, this is what I love doing. Give me the nursery every Sunday. Don't ask me to do anything else. I love taking it. That, that's, that's when things are really operating well. What other obstacles do you think we encounter in supporting and aiding one another in this image of the body? I think sometimes people really feel very nervous about their own ability to do things. They, they just are very reticent because they don't feel gifted. Mm -hmm. You know, he can empower us to do something that we might feel is a bit beyond us. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking of um, a lady at our church who um, helped with our food and clothing bank and she didn't feel particularly mm -hmm. able to do that. It was a kind of out of her comfort zone, but she stepped out. She believed God asked her to do it and, uh, and it's been amazing, but it's not a natural, oh, I just want to get straight down there. You know, she, yeah. she had to sort of step past that, that fear, really. Mm -hmm. And Brett McBride raised the issue of judgment within the body, individually or corporately, where we can start to think perhaps that our church or denomination or our gift 
is the best way or the only way to do something. How do you think we can keep from slipping into that tendency? It's all about our attitude where we get, not from the Spirit of God, we don't get that from God. We get it from our culture and we, we forget that our culture has made its imprint in us, whether we realize it or not. And, and to, we, we need to shun our cultural values and let Jesus kind of say, you know, you came to serve, you know, you are no better. And you, you get to go to that church that you're going, you get to go there and serve in my name. And, and, and that, there, there's countless people who, who, who want to do that. And, and, and they're, 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 they're not fated by the world, but they just are using their gifts quietly. And they're the backbone of the church, really. Pastors come, pastors go, but they stay there faithfully. And I think that's the spirit of Jesus. That's a healthy spirit. And if you have a healthy body, if you have that in, a, in a healthy church, um, God is honored by that, I think, yeah. Do you have anything to add, Jenny? Just that if, if the Lord has given uh, your body a certain emphasis, something that perhaps um, he's asking of you, perhaps you've got a great social justice ministry or, right. um, or he's really gifted you with great theologians or whatever it is, mm. um, that doesn't mean that everybody every church in the area will have the exact same things. And I think the tendency is to feel, well, we're just really good at this. Yeah. And then you sort of create a, this is what our church is good at, um, you know, missions or whatever it is, you know, this is our thing. Um, and that can make you then judgmental of another church that, well, why aren't they taking this seriously? This is a very serious issue because it's serious to your body. Yeah. But I think, again, the Lord is perhaps doing different things with different mm -hmm. bodies and that's okay. That's okay yeah, to not right. have everything all at once. Yeah, it's beautiful to see. When you place your faith in Christ, you become a member of His body, a necessary part intended to support others and be supported by others. And God places each of us as He wants us to be. It's a beautiful picture of unity within diversity. At times when I have um, had the A healthy body striving to be unified will still have moments of conflict and hurt. When we do, we can choose to be quick to forgive and not to judge, to want to understand and bring a swift resolution to repair and redeem. We know that when one part suffers, every part suffers. So let's seek the healing of that wound quickly. God is knitting us together by His Spirit and we don't want to unravel what he is doing. When we finally meet in heaven, every nation, tribe, and language, all one in Christ, what a beautiful body will be. All that diversity in perfect unity, displaying God's glory. Join us next time for more clear biblical teaching here on Living Truth. To watch this message again, visit our website, download transcript, order DVDs and CDs, as well as our daily devotional or sign up for our monthly newsletter. Online, you can sign up for podcast. You can also join us on Facebook and YouTube. Next week, we conclude the series from Brett McBride with a message called, A Healthy Body is a Loving Body. This is Living Truth.